Hi guys and welcome to a, another session of UK University Search's Webinar Wednesday. We've got a fantastic uh, edition today where we're going to be covering personal statements and we have two representatives from St Mary's University Twickenham who are going to be talking us through things today. We will be uh, going through the uh, presentation from Charlotte initially uh, and then we will be going over to a live Q&A session at the end. Uh, colleague Meg will be on the Q&A session um, via uh, text, which will be at the bottom of your screen. So if you do have questions um, during the presentation, then feel free to ask those on there. However, I would recommend just holding off a little bit on answering those questions initially, as many of the answers um, to those questions will probably be revealed during the presentation itself. Uh, so that's enough from me. Anyway, I'm going to pass you through to Charlotte from St Mary's University Twickenham, and she'll get going with the presentation. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks, Martin. Hi, everyone. Um, really, really nice to virtually see you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm sure we're all so super sick of everybody saying that. OK, right. What I will do whilst I'm doing the presentation is I'm going to turn my video off. Reason being is sometimes my Internet can go a little bit funny and I want it to go as smoothly as possible. I'll turn my video back on at the end. So I'll just start with that now. OK, right. So just to give you a little bit of idea of uh, who we are today. So my name is Charlotte. I am a student recruitment officer at St. Mary's University, and I'm joined today by Meg, who is also a student recruitment officer, um, and she focuses on schools and colleges. My focus is more on external events, uh, so like this today, um, and the on-campus events as well. So we wanna try and make today a little bit interactive. So if you do have your phone, um, we would love it if you would scan the QR code and that's going to take you to a Padlet. Um, and what you can do is you can interact with us on that. We've got some really helpful links there. Um, so if you'd like to just, I'll give you one more moment to just scan that and then we will get started. First off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about St Mary's before we move on to the personal statements. Um, and then we'll get started on the personal statement stuff too. So St Mary's University is a smaller university and we're based in St Mary, um, we're based in Twickenham, which is southwest London. We're a smaller university. We have a student population of about six and a half thousand, and that's of undergraduates and postgraduate students. And whilst that might sound like a lot of people, it's actually not very much at all when you compare to some other universities where their student population is around 30,000. So I'm just going to talk to you a few about a few stats. So we're actually ranked second in London for overall student satisfaction, and that was in the Sunday Times Good University Guide. And 75% of our graduates in 2018 slash 2019 achieved a 2-1 or a first class honours degree. 98% of graduates are in employment, vocation or further study within 15 months of graduation. And we are one of the top 10 safest university in England and Wales. So we're very, very proud of these stats, which is why I'm sharing them with you now. And just to give you an idea of kind of, you might think London probably doesn't look like this, but you'd be surprised. So I'm just using my cursor to go around. This is our campus. So we're a campus based university. So what that means is that we've got all of our buildings together in one place. Whereas a city university is where the buildings might be spread out and you might find that you kind of need like a bus to get from your accommodation to your lectures. Whereas campus universities, everything's all kind of put together. So we have halls of residence that are just over here. Um, and then you might find that your lectures over here. So the bonus of that is that if you are uh, a little bit late in the mornings, you haven't got far to run. Um, and you'll see what, which is quite niche to us is we actually have a running track right in the center of our campus. But what I'll do is I'll let our student ambassadors just tell you a little bit more about what it's like to be a student at St Mary's. I'm studying BA acting. I'm studying international business management. I'm studying sports rehabilitation. And I'm currently in my third year studying psychology at St Mary's University. I love St Mary's because I love how small the campus is. You get a real community vibe and plus the location is really good because 
it's not too far from central London and so you're in like a quiet area. But I think one of the main things is that community vibe, that community feeling. Um, like when I came to St. when I came to St. Mary's at first, um, I came to visit and I went to other universities um, and I just did not like how big it was. Uh, St. Mary's has given me the opportunity to meet so many people and to make so many networks um, and to meet people from all around the world um, in such a small space, you know. Um, you feel you're not a number, uh, but an actual person to your lecturers. And so as you get to know them, they get to know you. And because of that, I also think there's loads of support in place for you. And you get the sense that the staff there, all, all of them just want you to thrive and succeed. And that's just something really special about St Mary's. One thing that I love about St Mary's is that they have helped me make so many good friends, which has made my university experience so much better. On top of that, I love the university atmosphere and scenery, especially during the summertime. Advice I'd give to people applying for university is make sure you know what you want in a university before applying and choosing because that way you can narrow down which universities are right for you, such as your location, uh, whether you want to be far away from home or closer to home, and whether you want accommodation on campus and what their accommodation looks like and also obviously the course, what the course provides for you. One thing that I would advise when applying to university is to attend open days as it will give you a real feel of what the university experience will be like. The future applicants, uh, if you are, if you can't decide between going to St Mary's or another university, I would suggest to think about um, the environment. If you would like to be somewhere where there's lots of inclusiveness and there's loads of support available, then St Mary's is the way to go. Okay, so we're going to move on to the more personal statement stuff now. So this is what we're going to cover um in the next 20 25 minutes so we're going to look at what is a personal statement the preparation you need to do before you even start writing what content is expected from a personal statement we're going to go through the suggested structure what we want to avoid and we're, then we're going to have a look at some per, some examples of personal statements first off what is a personal statement so you might have heard this before you also might not have when i was looking at university um I had absolutely no idea what I had to write or what I was doing. So don't worry about it. This is hopefully you're going to go away from this feeling like you know what you uh, need to do and how to write it. But in simple terms, it's your chance to promote yourself to universities. You have one statement for all five choices. And it's actually a quite a small part, part uh, a small piece of writing. It's only 47 lines or 4,000 characters. Um, and it's actually less than a page of A4, so it's not long at all. It's not uh, thousands and thousands of words. So you get five course choices when you're applying to university, unless you're interested in applying for medicine, dentistry or veterinary courses, in which case you have four. You can choose one Oxbridge university. So that's you can either apply to Cambridge or Oxford. You can't apply to both. And universities don't know your other application choices. But what do you need to do before you even start writing? So we need to research what unis you're going to apply to, decide on a course, and you need to review your predicted grades. And we're going to go through why you will need to do those things. So how do you choose who to, uh, um, where to apply for? Because there's over 165 higher education providers in the UK, and there's over 45 just in London alone. So you have got so, so much choice and so many course choices as well. So, but I'm not sure why this slide was blank. I'm not sure what got deleted off this. Not sure what happened there. Apologies for that. Uh, but this slide was meant to be uh, about how many course choices there are. There are so, so many courses that you can do. 
If you would like to do um, maybe a joint honours degree, you're interested in perhaps studying history and English, you can do that. Uh, there are all sorts of combinations that you can do. But what we do need to think about is there are courses that have requirements. So, for example, English literature, you will need to have studied either English, either literature or language, or a humanities subject, that A-level or equivalent. Reason they ask for this, they want to see that you can write essays. They want to see how you can critique this kind of work. That's why they ask for it. If you're interested in studying medicine, you need to do biology and chemistry at A-level. But there are also courses that maybe you wouldn't have had the chance to study before. So not all colleges offer law as an A-level. So um, our law course doesn't have any subject specific requirements because they, we know that not all sixth forms and colleges offer it. But once again, they're kind of still looking at those critiquing skills, the essay writing skills. So they might look at a humanities subject as an alternative. But it's not always just about subjects and grades. So courses like acting, it will require you to have an audition and an interview. You've got courses such as primary education with QTS, which means qualified teaching status. So that means that you can work as a newly qualified teacher once you finish the course, as long as you pass everything. Uh, courses like this, they require an interview and numeracy and literacy tests, as well as requiring GCSEs in English, Math and Science at grade four or above. Then you have physiotherapy, which requires an interview and quite a lot of very specific grades requirements. And um, they're looking for very particular skills in physiotherapy. Check that the university offers the course you want. So not all universities have the same course selection. So for example, at St Mary's, we don't offer medicine, nursing, courses like that, we don't offer those. But there are other universities that do. So you might find that you absolutely love a course, but the university that you originally thought that you were interested in doesn't offer it. It's really important that you focus on the course rather than just the university, because the course is really what you're going to be passionate about and studying and focusing on. So find the course first, then you can worry about the university. So these are the four points I would suggest looking at. One, entry requirements. What do the courses you're interested in expect you to have? If the courses that you're interested in are asking for A star AA and your predicted BBC, you might want to have another think about it. Think about what you really want to achieve out of studying this course. There might be ways around it, but we don't want you to apply for something that is a little bit too high. Reason being is we don't want you to then kind of apply for all of those courses and it's just not possible for you to study at that level. Two. Which courses interest you the most? What could you see yourself studying for the next three years or more? What makes you excited? What do you want to do? Why, why do you want to study this? If you know what makes you excited about a course, you're going to write an absolutely cracking personal statement. Three, choosing where to apply. What is the most important to you? Would you like to commute? So live at home um, and, then, and then travel in? Or do you want to move far away? Do you want to live in a new place? Would you like to experience halls? What would you like to do? And four, read information, watch videos, visit universities when you can and ask questions. So use these opportunities to ask as much as possible. But what do you write in a personal statement? So we have a really handy video, which I'm going to play for you at the moment. I'll put the captions on as well. Your personal statement is your chance to tell the university or college you want to go to why you'd be great for their course. Every year, admissions tutors see thousands of personal statements. So how can you make yours stand out from the crowd? The best personal statements tend to be ones where uh, an applicant can effectively communicate uh, to us and bring a sense of themselves to the applications. I think the thing that really stands out with the personal statement is that the applicant has used um, evidence of their own achievements to support anything that they're, they're saying about their ability. And that's what I'm really looking for. I'm looking for richness, detail and evidence. Don't be ashamed of really being positive about yourself and your achievements. More than anything, you're looking for an application um, that is truthful and, and sort of honest to the person. I think the best thing is to see somebody who has a small amount of knowledge of the subject, really enjoys what they've understood. What's important to remember is an opportunity for you to really shine. 
and to promote yourself. What we don't want to see in a personal statement is any kind of negativity, whether that's regarding yourself and your achievements, or whether that's towards maybe a teacher or a tutor or somewhere else elsewhere. Avoiding cliches in your personal statement uh, is, is a good thing to do if you can do it. My kind of pet hate is the cliché first sentence. So the classic computer science example I have is uh, where, where a student says something to the effect of, I got my first computer when I was X years old. Um, it, I'm not sure why they want me to know that, um, but it's not, it doesn't really demonstrate much. You know, it's almost a, a sort of quasi joke that, you know, ever since I was a fetus, I've always had a deep passion for medicine. Uh, and the reality of it is that that's probably not the case. Almost every applicant appears to be passionate about whatever subject they've applied for. Um, and of course, it is important that they're enthusiastic about that subject. But how many teenagers do you know that, that usually use that kind of language to describe it? So it, it feels very false. And the other thing is probably more for, uh, for parents. Um, we do find that sometimes parents really want to talk uh, through their personal statement with their son or daughter, which is great, but when too much influence comes to bear and they start drafting it with them or indeed for them, we start hearing the voice of a 55-year-old rather than a 17-year-old. And actually, we want to hear the voice of you. I would say also not to make a personal statement that's too abstract um, and quoting uh, your favourite lines of, uh, of poetry or, or various other bits of literature. Personal statement should be a really, really positive document that really emphasises how good an applicant you are and what you've got to offer an institution. Basically, being honest and drafting it well, taking time, being thoughtful, uh, and, and those kinds of things are a really good basis for a personal statement. Love it. Okay. But I'm, I'm pretty sure when I was drafting my personal statement, I felt this. How am I meant to say I'm passionate without saying that I'm passionate about it? So it's really, really tricky, but we're going to go through how you can kind of move away from that. I am passionate about this and this, but we're going to talk about how you can make yourself give, give that impression without necessarily saying it quite like that. But how do you get started? This is one, actually, a really big tip of mine, um, and I use it whenever I'm doing writing myself. Write your introduction last. And I think the thing is, is we think, oh, it's an introduction. I should write it first. I should start at the beginning. Actually, sometimes it's really hard to start at the beginning because you, you want it to be amazing. You want it to be good and punchy and all those wonderful things. But it's really hard to get started sometimes. So sometimes it's easier to do other parts of it first. The bits that you know how to write, you know what you need to say. And then you can do the introduction at the end. I think it's the hardest part. Do it at the end. Use a template. And there's lots and lots of helpful stuff online. Um, we're happy to, to send templates and we're going to go through one with you now. And be aware that you're going to redraft this four, five, maybe more times. If you expect that it's going to be perfect from the start, you're going to be really disheartened when someone looks at it and kind of highlights bits, changes it. So don't expect it to be perfect from the start. And then you won't have that kind of crushing feeling when it does need to be redrafted. Expect it and then it won't be so difficult. So what I would say to start with is you need to write down all this kind of stuff. So what it is that you're applying for. Why are you excited to study this? What sparked your interest? So what made you go, oh, yeah, this is this is the course that I want to do. What experiences do you have to support your interests? And what skills do you have that will make you a great student on this course? We're going to get a look at the structure now. So this is the suggested structure that we would have. If you are interested in applying for an Oxbridge, so that's Oxford or Cambridge, then we would suggest that the academic achievements are more kind of 30% or 40%. But for the general population, this is what we're looking at, um, is this kind of amount. So 10% is your introduction. Why do you want to study the course? What interests do you have in the subject area? What aspirations do you have further to university study? So that might be, I would like to uh, study a master's at, in this course. I would like to become a teacher. I would like to um, work in this kind of field and I need this degree to work in this field. Your academic achievements. 
So this is about 20%. What academic achievements and experience do you have that's going to prepare you for university level study in your chosen subject? And is there any further reading in your subject of interest that you can support? Work experience, employment, volunteering, 20%. Write down any skills that you've gained from work experience, employment or volunteering, which is going to prepare you for university level study. So when I go into schools, I'm sure that Meg will feel this as well. Um, even if you've had like a part-time job, you volunteered, you have gained skills from that. Use them. Use every little bit of experience that you have in your life since, you know, in the last kind of school school years that you've had. It's really, really important that we use that to our achievement. I can talk to somebody and they're like, I don't have any work experience. I talk to them and actually I find out they've worked in three different places already. So don't sell yourself short on that, that section. Extracurricular activities and awards. This is another 20%. So this is about where you write any other experience which applies to the course that you're applying to. So maybe it's that you have been captain of your netball team. What did that teach you? Leadership skills, how to look after a team, how to keep um, momentum up, all that kind of good stuff. And then you have your conclusion. And this doesn't have to be that long. Once again, similar sort of length to the instruction. And you're going to finish with a brief summary. Why should you be offered a place? And remember what admissions tutor are looking for and leave them with a good impression. Leave them go, oh yeah, that was fantastic. And this is really important. Be honest. If you stretch the truth or just downright lie, you might end up in a worse situation later on than if you've just been honest. And the reason we kind of pull this out is because say, for example, I've, I've read personal statements and people have said, oh, I read this or I look at this and I'm like, oh, can you tell me a little bit more about it? And they look at me with this absolute face of terror because the reality is, is maybe they've actually only read the blurb of the book and they think, oh, it'll make me sound really impressive. The problem is, is that if you get caught out, you are not going to, you're not going to be in a good place if that happens to you. So think about it very, very carefully about the, the references you use, really understand them well. So Meg and I, we read a lot of personal statements. It's part of our job. And um, we see some pretty common pitfalls that uh, happen to people. So we want to go through some of them now so that hopefully you won't have to experience them. The thesaurus. OK, so I'm going to read the original, which is I remember how excited I was when my mother told me there was a kid my age moving into the old brick house, the one Mr. Pukowski died in. And then someone's decided that they're going to use a thesaurus and try and make it sound really smart. I recall how energized I was when my matriarch informed me there was an adolescent, my maturity, propelling into the aged brick dwelling, the one Mr. Bukowski expired in. It just does not work, does it? I'm sure you're thinking, oh, I wouldn't ever do something like this. You would be surprised. It happened uh, not even a year ago where I was in a school and even I was looking up words on my phone. I was like, I've got no idea what this means. And the reality is, is an admissions tutor would probably feel the same that I would. And when I kind of questioned um, the person that wrote it, they were like, oh, but no, it makes me sound really smart. And I said, it doesn't because it doesn't actually make sense in the sentence. So he didn't need it and it didn't help. Then we have exaggeration. I've wanted to be a doctor since I was in the womb. No, you haven't. It's unrealistic. Um, what? And it's, and it's also, it's not really very interesting, actually. I would much rather hear what sparked the interest in you becoming a doctor. Was it an experience? Was it a work experience that you'd, you'd done that you were invited to do? Was it that um, you come from a family that works medicine? What is it that really made you interested? It's not enough to just say that you've always wanted it. We need to know the specifics. Plagiarism. So this is where you copy other people's work. And sometimes this can be done even without us meaning to. But this, for example, this section here, ever since I accidentally burnt holes in my pyjamas after experimenting with a chemistry set on my eighth birthday, I have always had a passion for science. I mean, it sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? It's that kind of spark, uh, that interest. The difficulty with this, and unfortunately, is uh, 234 other people also use this example. So it's it just doesn't work. So we have a uh, uh, detection software called Copycatch, and it will look for plagiar plagiarism. 
So it's not a good thing to just copy. We want to hear your voice. It's it's not about making yourself sound smarter. We want to know what you think. So as you can see, uh, 370 sentences contained a statement beginning a fascination for how the body, human body works and 175 contained a statement which involved an elderly or infirm grandfather. So we really, we don't want you to fall, to fall for this. And also as well, try to avoid some really obvious opening sentences in your personal statement. So these are kind of like the top five that happen. So this is why, once again, why I kind of said, come back to the introduction. Don't start with it. It's the hardest part. Uh, so worry about everything else. Come back to this. Um, as we said as well, UCAS publishes a list of the most common opening statements, opening lines of personal statements. So you can try avoid it as well. And then being arrogant. And this is actually kind of a, a difficult thing, I think, because there is a difference between being arrogant and highlighting your skills. Um, and sometimes it can be a little bit difficult. What, what does it come under? And the reality is highlighting your skills and experience is difference to being arrogant because you use examples of how that you use these skills and experiences to enrich either your study or just your life or your community so there is a difference if you're being arrogant you're just kind of showing off you're not explaining how how and why it's good okay so we're going to move into some examples now so we're going to look at why, why do you want to study the subject? So this is obviously a big chunk in your personal statement. OK, so we're going to critique this. So my favourite subjects have always been science and maths because there is usually a right answer to any question that is imposed. I am a ravenous tiger feeding on maths and science to gain knowledge. I will do anything to know an answer. So I'm hoping that you're sitting there kind of going, oh, hmm, not sure about this one. Uh, it has some improvements. It can be better. But let's look at why it could be better. So usually a right answer. That's actually not that realistic. And when you kind of go into further study at university level, you learn that actually sometimes you end up with more questions rather than answers. So usually a right answer is not correct. I'm a ravenous tiger. It's an inappropriate metaphor. It's quite cringy. I would feel a bit uncomfortable if I read that. Um, so just kind of stay away from things like that. If someone kind of goes, oh, I'm not sure, it's better to leave out. Remember that not the, the person reading your personal statement, chances are they're probably not going to have exactly the same sense of humour that you do. So whilst your friends might think it's funny, you've got to think about the person who's actually reading it. And I will do anything to know an answer. I mean, you probably won't. That the, the reality of it is that you won't do anything to know an answer. So it's over exaggeration, stay away from it. Okay, so we're gonna have a look at this one. So this is a little bit more kind of put together and we'll explain why. Genetics and immunology are two aspects of biology. Sorry, my screen, uh, which I find thrilling. Recently, HIV was genetically altered to enable T cells to at attack cancerous cells with the without the virus causing disease to the host. The scientists' ability to isolate the reason why the virus was so deadly and use it to say instead to save lives proved as an exciting introduction to the field of medical healthcare. So this actually isn't very long, is it? It's, it's really, it's a couple of sentences, but it's really, really clear. And why is it interesting? Why do they find it interesting? And they really have understood something scientific. So we can see that they're going to, to be able to, to do well in this course. Okay, what do you currently enjoy studying? Okay, so we've got another one here. I have studied physical education by myself and have developed an interest in it. I would like to study PE and sports science. I feel that the two subjects combine well with one another. And on many occasions, I found that my knowledge of one has helped me with the other. So have a little think about this. What do you reckon? This isn't terrible. And this is the thing. It's, it's not awful, but it just, it could be a lot better. Um, this is how. So physical education by myself. Um, we need that expanded. It's OK that you work independently, but we need to know how do you do that? Is that through further reading? Is it through watching uh, um, academic videos? How is it that you learn independently? Interest in it. 
what's interesting about it? What what part of it? It's such a they're such huge subjects. Can you be a little bit more specific? Or sometimes um, someone once told me if I can write why at the end of your sentence, you haven't explained it well enough. Combine well with one another. Well, why do these subjects combine well with each other? Why do you think that? Okay, so have a, a look at something that's a little bit, a uh, little bit more what we would expect. Nutrition, physiology, and injury prevention are all topics which interest me. Informing the public on the benefits of exercise and correct nutrition are becoming progressively more important. I believe there is significant scope for the public to further understand nutrition, particularly as the UK, like so many developed countries, are struggling with increasing rates of obesity. Therefore, I believe the study, the study of nutrition and exercise complement each other. So that kind of really puts together why this person's interested in studying both. Um, how do those things kind of meet together? What is it that makes them work together? So something about a lot more that we would like to see. So this is where we talk about the any outside reading or related links. I maintain my close contact with biology and use different books as my references like science of biology. I've always enjoyed presentations by Professor Richard Dawkins. When I was younger, I made use of the Kingfisher Encyclopedia very often. So you might kind of look at this and be like, oh, great, they've, they've referenced two different uh, resources. So a book and then an encyclopedia and also, oh, sorry, no, three references. Um, but we don't really know much about any of them, really. Also, so I maintained my close contact. It's unnatural language. I don't I don't really understand what you mean by that. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that in a conversation. So I don't need to necessarily read it in a personal statement. Uh, science of biology. So this is the book. Well, how did you use it? What did you learn from it? What did you take away from it? And once again, I've always enjoyed. Why do you enjoy it? What is it that is interesting? So this is really where we look at the kind of the quality and not the quantity. We'd much rather you referenced one book and explained it really, really well. Um, we've got one more there. So I have applied my scientific knowledge and research towards my own resistance training at the gym. Through consulting scientific journals, I have researched muscle protein synthesis and optimal training for hypertrophy. Incorporating these findings into my training programs. For example, my recent research into scientific principles of strength training has been an important addition to my most recent exercise program, which I planned with my friends. So... Once again, we can kind of look at this and we really know that they are using their knowledge and applying it in a practical way, which is really, really exciting because that's what you're going to have to do at university level. So we want to hear much more like this. So as you can see here, they've only really referenced one specific person and it works. As we said, one, one smaller part, really well understood, we would much rather have. So our top tips, quality over quantity always we would much rather um you explain something well than try to put as many things in as possible natural language if you've read it out loud could you imagine yourself saying it it doesn't make sense if you try and make yourself sound smart it usually just doesn't work um believe me i've tried um i've written many personal statements in my time and it's much more important that we we can relate to each other and and we don't have to have that expectation that we need to sound clever we just need to be understood so aim to be understood rather than to sound clever wider reading we love to see it so we really do love to see it but we want to see it done well avoid the plagiarisms and the cliches we don't need them we've read them lots of times be be true to yourself and then Spell check, proofread it. So there's a couple of ways that you can do this. So with um, Microsoft Word, it does have an option where you can click on it to read it out loud to you. Um, and that's really helpful because then you can listen to it and kind of hear where anything doesn't sound quite right. Um, also as well, uh, it's something that my mum always used to make me do and it used to drive me up the wall, but actually it was really, really helpful. She would make me read anything I'd written out loud because then you start to go, oh, that word doesn't make sense. This sentence is too long. I can't actually breathe when I'm, when I'm saying it. Think about it being read out loud. And then last, be honest. 
We just want to know about you. We want to know why you're interested in this in this subject. We want you to be honest. And don't be afraid to ask for help. There is going to be so much help available for you. You can um, get in touch with universities. They, every university will have a student recruitment team who will be able to help you if you need it. There will also be people at your schools and your colleges who are specialists in this. They know how to help you. Don't feel like you have to do everything on your own. The support is there and we would love to help you and to help you with this next kind of step and challenge. So I'm going to finish off just so saying um, we have an undergraduate virtual taste today, which is coming up on Saturday, 13th of March. So that's this Saturday. If you do want to experience some kind of taster lectures, um, sometimes that's a really nice thing that you can talk about in your personal statement is that you've attended per, um, any taster lectures. Um, you can do that. You can book onto a, um, our taster day by our website. It will look like this. And we also have a chat to student function, which is through UK, um, sorry, through UniBuddy. And um, you can get in touch and ask students questions. But what we're going to do is we've now got some time for, uh, for, for some questions. So I think Meg has been looking after them by the Q&A function. Um, but we're also going to do some live with Martin. So I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Perfect. Lovely. Well, thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, it was a great presentation. Um, yes, as, as Charlotte said, we're now going to go on to the Q&A section. So uh, firstly, if we um, if you don't feel like Charlotte's covered absolutely everything, I'm sure she probably has. Um, but you've got any questions that you want to ask, please keep on using the Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom. Uh, or if you're viewing everything on YouTube, be sure to put your question in there. But fortunately, we've had a lot of um, good questions and a lot of pre-supplied questions. So I'll um, I'll put these across to you, Charlotte and hopefully if Meg is able to join us as well and perhaps we'll alternate between the two of you. So the first question I had through was, if you're applying to two different courses, how can I reflect my interest in both in my personal statement? Well, that is a fantastic question um, and, and really, really accurate. Um, you know what it is? Um, it really depends on how different the courses actually are. But what we would say is try to balance between the two of them um so kind of keeping it not too heavy on one subject or the other so just trying to keep the balance as, as even as you can if you are applying to two different subjects Meg do you have anything to add on that one yeah I think one of my top tips when I get this question is if you've written a personal statement for two different subjects um get someone to read it um, but don't tell them what you're applying for and then if they can recite back to your interests and they reflect the two courses you're applying for that's always a good sign that you've equally weighted what you're talking about um, but yeah as Charlotte said just make sure you reflect all your experiences and stuff within your personal statement. Fantastic in fact we just had a really really good question come through from uh, and it was do I need to have work experience if I'm doing an EPQ? Um, yeah, it's not essential. No, it's not essential um, to have work experience. And someone else asked a really good question as well as to whether work experience was something essentially you had to write on your personal statement. But think about the course you're applying to. If you can talk more about your academic achievements and your EPQ, that's absolutely fine if you're relating it to your course. But you don't need, it's not an essential criteria to have work experience to apply for university. So don't worry yourself too much. Talk a lot about your EPQ. That's a really good independent project um, and assignment that you get to do whilst you're at um, college or school so yeah again don't worry too much about work experience if you don't have any fantastic and thanks for submitting that question um uh this would be quite good for both of you actually to answer because you might have a different experience of this what is the number one mistake that students make when completing their personal statement oh the number one mistake uh, I think I would go for, um, and this is probably is actually really from personal experience is, um, not listening to people's advice who have done it before me. And I was very much like, no, I know what I'm doing. I know the course that I want to do. I think I'm really funny. Uh, and of course it wasn't funny at all. And it, I pretty much, when I first wrote a personal statement, I did pretty much every cliche in the book. Uh, I started with a quote. I didn't really understand what I was writing for. I thought that I had all of the 
necessary requirements for the course and actually I just didn't and it meant that I wrote a really bad personal statement and I can I can say this now with hindsight uh I'm I'm 10 years on from that now um so the number like the number one thing use the help that is given to you read other people's personal statements talk to people that you know who've already applied to university um and it's really really good that you're already attending stuff like this because it means that hopefully you won't make the same mistakes that I will that I did <laughs> um so in terms of like tips I guess when um, I see personal statements sometimes people don't explain their points I think what everything Charlotte said is fantastic as well I completely agree with that in terms of getting help but think about also your English kind of um lessons where your teachers told you to do point evidence explain it's the best way to make sure that you're actually um talking and telling us why like when Charlotte's in her presentation if you can write why after your sentence and you haven't explained yourself well so I think a lot of the time when I'm looking at personal statements of students I'm always saying okay but add an evidence piece like tell me why so I guess that would be my top tip as well Great, thanks guys. Uh, lots of really, really good questions coming through on the Q&A, so please do continue with that, guys. Uh, next question, um, let's see, which one should we go for? Okay, will it look bad if I do not use my word slash character limit when doing my personal statement? I don't think it, it necessarily looks bad. I think you need to think about, what, it's, it's actually not very much at all. So I would be, it's, I would be surprised if you didn't end up using all of it. Um, Meg, what's your take on that one? Yeah, it doesn't look bad. I think as long as you've covered the main section, so you've done an introduction as to why you want to go to university and why you want to study your course, you've covered your academic achievements and you've given us evidence and you explained it and why that makes you a successful candidate for university, I wouldn't worry too much. Um, but again, if you have space for characters, that's excellent because it means you can explain something in more detail. So don't think, oh, I don't have enough to write think about, okay, how can I just explain this project a bit further? Um, but again, you know, we want to see a personal statement that's really concise and written well. So if you're under the character limit, that means you actually have been concise with your words and you might be a really good writer. So don't panic if you're not on the 4,000 character um, word count. In fact, that's just a huge opportunity because I would have loved to have been in that position because <laughs> I ramble a lot. So yeah, don't worry too much. I and mean, it doesn't reflect badly as long as you've said, this is why I'm a good candidate for university. Fantastic. Thanks again, guys. Um, another good question which had just been submitted. I'm in year 12. When should I start writing my personal statement? I'm happy to answer that one if you want, Shell. Um, yeah, so I would always recommend that you use your summer before you go into year 13 really wisely. So this is a good chance for you to kind of research the degrees that you might be interested in, start even just putting down bullet points. So the structure that Charlotte gave you during the presentation, if you were to just bullet point things during the summer, that's a really good time to kind of get your ideas out. And then once you're back in school in year 13, you can then start drafting it up until January when the deadline is. Um, it's important to remember that your school will probably have an internal deadline that's a lot sooner than January. So definitely get started once you're back in school in September. Obviously, if you're applying for either Cambridge or Oxford, get that personal statement like started in the summer like make sure you're ready to submit in October but you also have time for someone to check it and so forth um so yeah use your summer really wisely would be my takeaway from that question there are some really really great questions coming through in the Q&A guys so keep coming through with them uh picked up another one which I think is a good one a very very good point to raise um what do you do if your school doesn't offer many extracurricular activities especially now with COVID I think that I would, um, I, I think that's a very, very good and a niche issue that we're having at the moment. Um, what I would look at is kind of then how could you expand on your own personal research into the, the, either the course or the kind of topic that you're interested in. So how have you used kind of more virtual, um, resources that are available now that things have become a lot more online how can you use that so you would kind of just be moving things around a little bit more expanding on other stuff a little bit um more than maybe you would have and know that also you're not alone in that situation as well there will be a lot of um, other people who have had their extracurricular activities cut short because of covid 
Perfect. Um, I, I think one of the questions earlier on, we alluded to EPQs on there, and a couple of people have actually asked about what an EPQ is and whether something like that should be included on the personal statement. Are you guys able to fill in the gaps on what an EPQ is? Yeah, so an EPQ is essentially an extended project, I believe. I'm not an absolute expert on FE qualifications, um, but it's an extended project. So for the person that was asking um, about whether they should have work experience or not, essentially an EPQ is a fantastic way to show off that you've done some independent study because an EPQ can be in various different topics and some colleges and some schools may offer that. Um, if you haven't heard of an EPQ, um, you can always ask your teachers if it's something that they offer, um, but usually in year 12, you might have heard of that by now. Um, but yeah, an EPQ is essentially an extended project, which gives you extra UCAS points. Fantastic. I'll go to one of the uh, pre-supplied questions as well now. Um, all right, which one should we pick? OK, I think this is a good question, especially as I've, I've seen that there's a few people uh, answering questions who are actually from outside the UK. Um, will I be penalised if English isn't my first language? No, you wouldn't be penalised if you're in, if English isn't your first language. Uh, but I would just take care as much as you can in regards to uh, getting someone to kind of check it over for you so we can look for kind of any spelling, grammatical kind of things that could um, be difficult for you to notice if English is your second language or, or third or fourth. Sorry for the delay there. OK, fantastic. Um, right. This is uh, possibly a simple one to answer, but I think it's a good one. Uh, is it worth name dropping the universities I'm interested in within my personal statement? Um, um, I, oh, uh, I think that there's a very quick answer to this one. I would say I wouldn't do it. Um, and the reason why is because uh, your statement's going to get sent to all of them because you're using the same bit of writing so uh i would not name drop meg what were you gonna say sorry yeah, I, gonna say off exactly, I was gonna say exactly the same thing i mean the only exception to that is if you're applying for five courses at the same university but the likelihood of you doing that is very very small and that goes for like location and stuff if you're applying for universities across the country don't just mention one city and so forth Okay, um, we, we covered a little bit about kind of uh, plagiarism um, a bit earlier on in the session and also things that can be picked up if it's um, uh, if it's copied from something else. Someone's asked a question about is it worthwhile including a quote from someone who inspires me? So what would you think on that? Meg, would you like to go on that one? Sure. I mean, it's absolutely okay to use a quote from someone that inspires you. I think the issue with plagiarism and like cliches is that a lot of time people will use the same quote or they'll use it at the beginning of their personal statement. So it doesn't come across very unique. So an example of that might be like, um, knowledge is power, education is power, for example, which is a really famous quote. That would be, okay, well, we've heard that before. If you're doing um, your academic section, for example, of your personal statement, and you've written that you really enjoy a book and this person inspires you, absolutely use a quote that you can then expand on. It's about how you use the quotes rather than, oh, a blanket ban across all of them, if that makes sense. If you use it wisely and use it really well and you explain it, that's fine. But maybe avoid starting your personal statement with a really, really overused quote, if that makes sense. <laughs> no, that makes perfect sense. I'll, I'll go from one more question from the pre-supplied and then perhaps the three of us can just make our way through the Q&A and pick out some others that we'd like to answer live. Um, so the final one from the pre-submitted, uh, if I submitted my personal statement, but I wanted to make some changes to it, can I do this? Uh, short answer is no, unfortunately not. That's what why we, we put so much effort and prep into getting them ready and why uh, your college teachers and school teachers will be making sure that it's absolutely 100% ready before it gets sent off. You cannot take it back, unfortunately. No, that makes sense. OK, just going through to some of the uh, live questions that are coming through. Um, one from Phoebe Davis asking, do all courses require a personal statement? Um, via UCAS, yes, I believe it has to be submitted on the application. And even like directly to the institution, they would always ask you for a personal statement as well. It's like applying for a job if you think about it that way. Um, should experience you've had as a result of COVID be included within 
uh, uh, sorry, included if it had an, a substantial impact. So I'm going to read that again. Should experiences you had as a result of COVID be included if it had an, a substantial impact? I think you will just need to think about why, why do you want to talk about it? Um, a lot of people have, uh, have really kind of had very different experiences of the pandemic. And we know that this is going to affect choices that um, younger people are making and course choices. So I think it's fine to reference it. Think really carefully about why you're referencing it um, and the decisions that it's led on from. So I wouldn't speak too much about it. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Meg, did you want to add, add to that at all? I just have an anecdotal version of that, actually. I went into schools while it, the lockdown, I think the second one, whenever it was, was actually um, relaxed and schools were actually back in, in November. And some people had used COVID as an example to explain why their extracurricular stuff had stopped. And that's fine because that's justification of why you might not be ex able to expand on something. On the flip side of that, I had a student applying for immunology and actually going to study viruses and they didn't mention the pandemic. So I think, you know, there's a balance between, you know, depending on what you're going to study, it might be important to mention COVID, but as Shah said, think really carefully about why or why you aren't uh, mentioning COVID. Got a good question from Jill Hankinson, uh, which is a little bit aside from personal statements, but when do applications need to be in for entry 2022? And when should we be accessing the open days? Oh, great. I'm going to cover the open days question, but if I can get Meg to do the dates for applications. Yeah. You can go first, sorry. Okay. So, <laughs> so open days. So when you're applying for September 22, we would usually suggest that you start looking at open days June 2021. So we are at the moment planning for a mixture, a hybrid version of both uh, online and an in-campus offer on campus offering. Uh, we don't know what will go ahead at the moment. And then in the autumn, our hope is that we will be able to do both again. Um, so that is when you should be starting to go to open, open days, do your research. It, it kind of coincides with Meg saying about how she would suggest that you look at your personal statement stuff over the summer, you know, about bullet pointing stuff. You can use kind of the open days to, to uh, support your personal statement work. Um, in terms of when to submit your application 2022, every year, roughly, it will be early September. So I'm just looking at the key dates for last year. And it said the application is open in early September. So it'll be around that time, essentially. So this September coming, once clearing's over for this year's cohort, then just check on the UCAS website. So yeah, just keep checking back on the UCAS website for further updates. They don't have a date release for 2022 yet, as I can see on my phone. Um, but yeah, that's the place to be, or go, rather. Uh, we've had a question uh, through from Fatima a couple of times with regards to uh, who appears to be in the UAE, I think she wrote earlier on, and she's made reference about accessing UCAS from abroad. Do you know if there's any particular complications with doing that or does she need to wait until she's back into the UK? I don't think there's any problems with using UCAS as such because it is an online system. The only thing I it would probably be more... Uh, about student finance or anything like that depending on that but from UCAS point of view Meg do you have anything? Um, there's no reason why a student from the UAE shouldn't be able to use UCAS I think if you're having issues with accessing UCAS um, speak to um, anyone advising you in the country or speak to UCAS themselves it also might be worth looking at the websites of the universities you're thinking of applying to and getting in touch with the international team but you should be able to apply via UCAS um, from the UAE. Okay, we'll do uh, a couple more questions. Um, would you be penalised for accidental plagiarism um, if you hadn't plagiarised, <laughs> if you hadn't plagiarised, but the system flagged it up? Would there be a particular issue with that? I guess that's about whether you can try and explain yourself away from that. But have you guys got any thoughts? Yeah, I can answer that. I have been asked it a couple of times. Um, essentially, when we get, for St Mary's in particular, we might receive an application. We've seen it's been plagiarised or it hasn't been plagiarised, but we get it gets notified to us. Um, we might respond to the student and be like, OK, you know, we'll let you write this again if you can justify why this happened, whatever. Other universities won't be so... Um, what's the word lenient but if you genuinely haven't plagiarized I really really wouldn't worry to plagiarize you'd have to literally copy I think it's over 10 words or more 
and the likelihood of you doing that in a way that is if it's something common honestly I w- really wouldn't worry is the answer to that if you haven't purposely gone out and plagiarized or copy and pasted please don't worry yourself about it yeah a good thing to do as well is um, if you're concerned about kind of plagiarism as well when you're looking at an idea from somewhere else sometimes what I find helpful read it through close the book go back to it and then write it how you remembered that yeah, that's a good tip Right, I'm going to pick out one final question. Um, if you, if we haven't gone through all of the questions and answered them, we will be staying on slightly after the session is finished and we'll be writing some of these um, in the Q&A directly. But we'll pick one more. Um, I think this is a, a good one because I think a lot of people might be going through this at the moment. It's come through from Stella McMahon. With no work experience or volunteering opportunities over 2020, what other things are unis looking out for as alternatives? Uh, she's used the example of MOOCs, perhaps. Um, as alternatives, I don't know, Shah, are you about to answer that question? You can if you want, no? <laughs> um, as alternatives, I mean, I think Charlotte touched on this earlier, like do some um, independent research. That's a good way to kind of show to us that despite the challenges the year has faced, you know, you're still really interested in your course. You've gone out of your way to do some independent reading I mean there's so many different things I mean this year for me personally like the whole digital aspect of stuff is like really really interesting and to see students say that they've created like online platforms or that kind of thing is really cool as well but there's not something specific we're looking for we're just looking for a student that really loves the subject they're applying for and as long as that comes across within the personal statement um, they shouldn't worry too much if they haven't been able to work and so forth because we everyone's going to be in the same position and I think that's going to be reflected within the entire batch of personal statements we received this year. Great, okay, fantastic. Well, that will be the last question that we'll do for today. Um, like I say, please do hang on though, because we will uh, go through the questions after the session is finished. So hopefully you'll get an answer come through then. Um, you'll be able to see uh, St. Mary's actually at a virtual fair that we're running next Wednesday. I'm just pasting the web address uh, onto the Zoom chat and we'll do so uh, do so for the YouTube chat as well. Um, in case you don't see that, the web address is ukunisearch.vfairs.com. You'll be able to see St Mary's uh, amongst 112 other exhibitors on the day, so be sure to check that out. Uh, I'm sure you'll uh, join me in thanking Charlotte and Meg for the session they've done today covering personal statements, and I hope you guys learned a lot from the session itself. So thank you once again for joining us, and we hope to see you next week at our virtual fair. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.